Uh, good morning all. Um, my name is John Burke. I'm a colorectal surgeon uh, based in Dublin. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Professor O'Connell, our president, for the invitation to chair this session and um, for the, those of you tuning in and most importantly our four speakers. Uh, while it's often overstated, I truly believe the last decade has seen considerable change in the practice of colorectal surgery. From the practice of and the perspective of cancer and inflammatory bowel disease surgery, the perioperative treatments, which were once limited, have now rapidly expanded and this has introduced complexity in perioperative decision making. After the hiatus, after the introduction of laparoscopy, we now have a rapid expansion in the techniques both for resectional surgery and proctology, which require careful evaluation and safe introduction. And all the while, as we try to incorporate these novel complex paradigms of decision making and technique into our practices we work in an environment of increasing scrutiny and due to factors outside of our control our emergency workload increases it's for these reasons that i've invited our four speakers to share with us their thoughts today and moving on to our first speaker um, that is mr kieran walsh uh, Kieran is an old friend and a consultant colorectal surgeon in Wirral in the northwest of England. Uh, he's a graduate of RCSI and after training in Ireland and research in North America, he completed higher training in the UK, culminating in a fellowship in the Cleveland Clinic before his appointment to Wirral in 1998. He's an honorary lecturer at the University of Liverpool and his clinical interests in inflammatory bowel disease, surgical nutrition and complex hernia surgery and has led many leadership roles, uh, both locally and nationally within the UK. Uh, he is past president of the Northwest Surgical Society, uh, past president of the Royal Society of Medicine section of coloproctology, and has served on the executive of the ACP GBI. He's witnessed firsthand the challenges faced by the modern colorectal surgeon in restructuring of emergency general surgery and I can't wait to hear his lecture how to prevent the colorectal surgeon becoming the de facto emergency surgeon. Thank you Kern. John uh, thank you so much thank you for the invitation good morning everybody um, it's great to be with you uh, in St Stephen's Green albeit, uh, albeit remotely. So I um, got some uh, disclosures to make, um, just need to move on to the next slide. I'm sorry, I can't work out how to do that just at the minute. Sinead, um, can you just explain to me what to do here, just to move this down, thanks. Thanks so much. So I, I have some uh, disclosures. Um, as John said, I work in a district hospital in the UK on Merseyside. Um, I've been doing general surgery as an, and the emergency take as a colorectal surgeon for the, for the last 24 years and, uh, and, and counting. And I was actively involved in introducing emergency general surgeons to our trust, um, rather than just pursuing the, the standard model of appointing more colorectal surgeons and upper GI surgeons. So I've been involved in this, as John said, for, for a few years. And as a result of that, my final disclosure is undoubtedly the case. I certainly am not young enough to know everything, but what I do know is that Primary care in the UK is really struggling. Ambulance crews and emergency departments are struggling. We see pictures such as this with ambulances stacked up outside our hospitals, waiting to unload their payload into our departments. And when they get in, 
this is an all too familiar site. Now, this isn't a worst case scenario. This isn't a research meeting where you present your only, your best slide and say this is a typical result. Unfortunately, this is day in, day out. We've got ambulance crews stuck in our emergency department with poor individuals in chairs and trolleys who cannot get to be seen by doctors. As a result, there are huge waits inside the departments and outside. People are waiting for ambulances for hours as a result of this. And the whole thing is really exploding into a horrible mess. This just not just in England, it's not just known to people inside hospitals, the country knows it. It's the same in Scotland as it is in England, it's the same in Wales as it is in Scotland, and we really have a problem. But this pressure is going right through the hospital system. The emergency take in surgery is extremely busy. We know that EGS represents over half our general surgical workload, we know now in the UK at least that there's an expectation of significantly increased consultant input very early in the emergency surgical pathway. In our hospital we're on call of increasingly uh, more junior trainees and often with locums, agency locums we don't know. And this is on a backdrop of the fact that approximately 80% of all general surgical deaths come from emergency admissions. This is a critically important group of patients. But that said, only about 10% of the acute surgical take has an operation, and only about 10% of these are laparotomies. So it, it's a, there's, a bit of a, there's a bit of a disconnect, and I'll come back to disconnects later on. But there's an expectation of the consultant to be present for any operation in our, in our trust with a more predicted mortality of over 5%. And these emergency laparotomies are very carefully scrutinised now. This is the seventh year of the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit in England and Wales. In the most recent iteration, you can see there were nearly 22,000 patients audited in that time period, and a vast amount of data is collected, ranging from patient age, whether they were seen by a consultant surgeon before they had their operation, whether a consultant surgeon was involved in their operation, who the anaesthetist was, whether they had their sepsis controlled, etc., etc. In our place at Arrow Park, we are doing okay, we think. And I say we think because whilst we appear to have a good 30 day operative mortality. You can only have an operative mortality if you operate. And one needs to be very careful that nihilism doesn't get in the way. And you make sure that you actually look at the outcomes of people who are presenting with the conditions and not favoring only the outcomes of people who have surgery. So you've got to be careful that you don't refine too much. But we certainly had 96% of cases had a consultant surgeon input before the theatre and 100% of cases had a consultant surgeon in theatre if the predicted risk of death was greater than 5%. So what does Neela suggest the indications for emergency laparotomy are? Well, using their metrics, their obstruction, sepsis, ischemia and bleeding in that order. And the operations that are most commonly performed are names that you're pretty familiar to colorectal surgeons. Adhesiolysis, small bowel resection, right hemiclectomy, Hartman's and subtotal. So if you then look at that in the, through the lens of uh, this important publication, the British Journal of Surgery in 2019, based on NELA data, where Boyd and Carson and colleagues showed that the outcomes are better if surgeons who are within specialty operate, and also that there's an increased risk of returning to theatre with colorectal pathology treatment by non-colorectal surgeons. The same is true for for the upper GI fraternity and their cases. But if you put these two together in the context of the talk that I've been asked to give, and certainly if you talk about the operating emergency surgeon, the question has to be answered with, with some considerable difficulty if you're using a traditional care model. The Boyd Carson paper prompted an editorial comment from in the British Journal of Surgery, talking about difficult issues, the general surgical community at large, need for uh, expertise in upper and lower pathology, synchronously performing surgical services and providing need for training and workforce planning, which cannot be ignored. So as John said at the outset, there is a real issue here. And there's increased colorectal surgical appointments in the UK year on year, 
there's concern about the nature of the job plans that are being presented to potential consultants. The pressure from the acute care has led to increased time in their job plans. When you put this together with the amount of time it might take for a minimally invasive surgical complex major colorectal case combined with modern, modern anesthetic times, if you had such a job plan, you might only do one complex major case a week. I mean, it's extraordinary. Colorectal surgeons are doing colonoscopy and supporting gastroenterology provision. There's a huge increase in screen time in the UK, We're doing virtual clinics and endless, and I mean endless amounts of admin. So all of these factors are coming together to appoint more and more colorectal surgeons. And it's not surprising, therefore, that if the colorectal surgeons are populating a department, then they will be the people who are doing the on-call or the emergency take. So we have two related disconnects. We have the disconnect in elective practice, where we're having more and more people appointed, but they're actually doing less operating oftentimes. And we have the disconnect in emergency. And that emergency disconnect is, as I said, on Wirral, we reckon that only about 10% of our acute take gets an operation, and only about 10% of these laparotomies. So there's a, an enormous amount of acute biliary presentations that require upper GI input and expertise. We have an endless amount of alcohol-related presentations, and we have all the surgical variants of geriatric off-legs that keep us overly busy. So there's an enormous amount of emergency work that's not specifically related to operative surgery, not least colorectal surgery. And so the question is, how do we cope with this? And talking of disconnects, there's another one. There is a large grey animal in a room, and it's not got to do with the endless bloodshed that seems to be spilled in the UK at the moment between upper GI surgeons trying to come off on call rotors and between colorectal surgeons and upper GI, but it's something that's not being discussed. And that's the disconnect between elective surgical technique and emergency surgical technique. Elective surgery, I would reckon in most UK departments and Dion and others will correct me if I'm wrong, is about 80-20 in favour of minimally invasive surgery. But in emergency surgery, where it's about 80, 20 in the other way. It's about 80% open, only about 20% minimally invasive. So we're training all these young surgeons, recently appointed surgeons who are experts in minimally invasive techniques. But when it comes to emergency surgery, they're having to do oftentimes open surgery that they may not be that familiar with. And this applies to both colorectal surgeons as well as to upper GI surgeons. So, about seven years ago, when I was our clinical lead, we, we looked at the fact that we needed new appointments, but we tried to redress these disconnects. And we appointed uh, emergency general surgeons to work alongside our colorectal and upper GI surgeons. We now have five EGS surgeons, six colorectal and four upper GI for our population of about 420,000 people. And what was, why did we go down this road? Well, <coughs> The first question I asked myself was, if we kept appointing more colorectal surgeons, what elective work were they going to do? How many rectal cancers do we have? How many colon cancers do we have? How many pelvic floors do we have to repair? And when you look at the great and the good who are doing elective colorectal surgery to an enormously high standard, can we actually offer that in a hospital such as ours if everybody's doing two or three low rectal cancers a year? Well, clearly not. And the IBD audit showing 1.5 as a median of ileoanal pouches is a testament to the sort of state that we're in where we need to subspecialize electively, but we need generalists and for the emergency takes, so it's a problem. But we're appointing more and more of the wrong people. If we're appointing subspecialists, that doesn't make sense if 50% of the workload is, is emergency surgery. And as a result, we run the risk of getting a dissatisfied and unfulfilled GI surgical workforce. But more importantly, we run the risk of getting the poor, our poor care for our sickest and our highest risk cases. If we look at the consultant EGS surgeon model, these are surgeons who are specifically interested in the plurality of emergency general surgery. They have these emergency cases at their heart. This is what they want to do. It's an applicable role and appropriate for different people at different stages in their career, whether they're planning on exiting their career in the near future or just starting out on their career, or if they're going through a 
point in their career where they want to have a stable workaday platform where they don't have to do nights or they might want to do sessions at different times, they have that control. But the patient-centric, integrated, collaborative pathways of, of care that is dominated by a philosophy of um, admit, uh, assess to admit and not uh, uh, just admitting everybody and then seeing what happens. It's patient-centric. We have hot clinics. We have uh, designated scan slots. We have ambulant care pathways. We have inpatient care pathways for common presentations, such as small bowel obstruction, complex diverticulitis. And importantly and excitingly, we have new EGS-driven approaches to emergency laparotomy, which in our uh, hospital, Richard Guy has driven with rapid source control, resuscitative surgery and temporary closure techniques, then with second look laparotomies with subspecialty support as required. Alongside this, and if you're going to succeed in this, your elective teams, the upper GI surgeons, your lower GI surgeons, that we need to work differently and we're trying to work differently. We need to appreciate that our elective work will dictate our emergency commitment. We need to bring cases back in from out of hours into in hours, and we can do this. If we offer an excellent consult service, we say yes, we see the patient, we plan for them to come to a hot clinic in our service. We need to accept that we have a commitment to emergency surgery, but it's different. We create pathways that lead to predictable outpatient care and we create job plans for colorectal surgeons that accommodate this predictable urgent operating. We run colorectal hot lists that take on the predictable urgent cases. And there are many of these. You know them. We have about 20% about of our cancers come in as emergencies. They might need to be stented. They might need to be buffed up a little bit. They need to be rehydrated, nourished and dealt with. But they doesn't have to be in the middle of the night. Acute colitics, even after they've had their 15th monoclonal, still often need an operation. The non-colitic acute presentations, stenting obstructed cancers, the large bowel obstructions that don't need out of our surgery, or the non-settling acute diverticular case, and not to mention the un unwelcome, unplanned returns to theatre, of which colorectal are a great supplier. So we have our own work to do. But if I was to answer the question I was asked of how to prevent the colorectal surgeon becoming the de facto emergency surgeon, I would say, colorectal surgeons accept that you have a commitment to emergency surgery and that is an impor important and integral part of colorectal surgery. You must ensure within a hospital that that philosophy is shared by other general GI surgeons. You need to appreciate that your elective work patterns will impact on your emergency work and you need to change your elective patterns. You need to produce a job plan that allows people to be available to do this predictable, urgent work. You need to have a high quality colorectal service. Stop trying to hide from consults that you don't like the look of. Get on and see them, control them, take them into your practice and deal with them in hours so they don't come back and bite you out of hours. The Association of Coloproctology are acutely aware of our contribution to emergency general surgery. That's the Association of Coloproctology of Great Britain and Ireland. We have an emergency general subcommittee and we're producing and have produced guidelines and consensus statements. All good. But look, if you keep appointing colorectal surgeons, they'll fill the rota and thereby, by definition, will become the de facto emergency surgeon. So don't appoint them, a train and appoint who we need to do what we need to do to deliver the care that our community. And remember 50-80, 50% of our emergency general surgical workload is emergency and 80% of general surgical deaths are within this group of patients. So we need expertise. I would argue you appoint emergency general surgeons, you appoint well, cleverly, you pick people who are at different stages of their career, who want different things. They might not be with you for more than three, four, five years, but build a department. They need to be well paid. They need to be compensated for heat and burden. They need to be attractive jobs with attractive job plans. And they need to attract a diverse group of general surgeons. Encourage academic output, university collaboration, university appointments within EGS. 
and his colorectal surgeons support and work together with them in whatever variation of this model that's right for your hospital. And then underpin this EGS service with a reorganized subspecialty colorectal infrastructure. Thank you very much. Kieran, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, it really portrays your experience and the thought that you've put into this subject over years that we continuously struggle with here in Ireland. Um, before questions come in from uh, from the audience, I might just ask, what type of trainee coming off program do you find is attracted to the EGS role? Well, I'd say, first of all, John, that I think a lot of trainees are very scared by the EGS role. My perception is that they think this is senior registrarship by proxy. And this is what we have to get rid of, is this mentality, not within the trainees. The trainees are entitled to have that view, and I can understand why they have that view. But it doesn't make sense to keep making really clever guys and girls who sit in the corner of a room on a big machine with their shoes off with massive magnification displaying beautiful anatomy. It's only part of what we need. We have to train the people we need in our community. And I would argue that the, the emergency general surgical service should be seen as a, a quilt made up of different patches, different types of people. Maybe somebody coming to the end of their career, maybe somebody like me wants to come out of my normal role and go into EGS. I might have a role training people doing emergency laparotomies during daylight hours. Equally, somebody who's got a young family might think, well, that's what we want to do for a few years. Or somebody who's not maybe sure that they want the, the con traditional consultant role. So I think all comers. But we've got to, uh, we've got to reassure people who are coming out of training programs that they're not second-rate citizens. These are, they, that's why I made the point you need quality jobs, quality job plans, respected as equal consultant colleagues, really important. And they'll devolve, they'll evolve in their career. Great. And it's just a follow-on question, you know, like yourself, I trained in the Cleveland Clinic and I felt very lucky to have the mix of both minimally invasive, but also complex reoperative surgery, which I always look back on in the middle of the night doing those bad laparotomies that you talk about. Um, do you think the curriculum for general surgery and the requirements in terms of case numbers are sufficient to prepare trainees for those types of cases? I really don't, uh, is, is my first answer. And I think we all the emphasis is on the uh, elective caseload. I think we have to find a way of bringing people securely into the environment of doing emergency laparotomies again. And particularly when so much of their training is in MIS and MIS approaches, when we're only doing so little of that, at the moment at least, in the emergency environment. And it's a different type of operating. Mm -hmm. A colleague of mine near where I work refers to it as farmyard surgery. You know, it's scoop and run. But you need to learn it. It's a different skill set. I mean, I, for one, I, I remember I, I was doing emergency heartments the wrong way for years as a consultant, because I tried to do it as an elective colorectal resection rather than getting in and doing source control and Richard Guy who's our head of uh, EGS surgery until recently has really been retraining us in in, in it's like trauma for it's it's non-trauma trauma mentality your, your your source control temporary closure mechanisms come back with the with the skill sets with with the subspecialty but no your question is uh, i think the answer to your question is that i don't know that people are and i don't think they feel they are and i think that's why we need to have an integrated department where people are supported and that might be a reason or a way to continue to involve people old people old lags like myself continue to employ me but not maybe in the middle of the night where i'm I get up in the middle of the night, my bounce back ability is limited now at my age, but where I have a role might be in the middle of the day, overseeing these emergency laparotomies with the trainees and teaching them some of the stuff that we know. Because at the moment we have people who are trained in open surgery and MIS surgery, and there's enough in a department. But in a few years, most people filling the department will be MIS trained. And that may not be pertinent to emergency surgery of a high quality. 
I've I've great confidence in your bounce back ability. Um, but uh, as we don't have any further questions, we might leave it there. And I I just like to thank you again. I thought that was a, a real tour de force on this on this topic. Thank you. Um, so moving on to our next speaker is uh, Professor Dion Morton, uh, who is a colorectal surgeon who graduated from Bristol in 1990, 1985 and following extensive training and research in the UK, rose to the position of Barling Professor of Surgery and head of the Department of Surgery at the University of Birmingham. He is the director of the West Midlands Genomic Medicine Centre, co-leads the NIHR Research on Global Surgery and co-chairs the ESCP uh, Global Research Committee and was previously the Director of Clinical Research at the Royal College of Surgeons, Chair of the Research Committee of ESCP and past President of SARS. He was awarded the OBE in 2020 for his services to the NHS and some of his enduring impact is on the popularization of surgical involvement in large-scale randomized trials, particularly trained, trainee-led research initiatives such as the West Midlands Research Collaborative. One of his most important trials, in my opinion, is the Foxtrot trial. And with this in mind, I think we're very lucky to hear him speak about neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy for cancer of the colon and rectum. Is it ready for prime time? Professor Morton. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, John. Uh, it's nice to know that all your best work was in a previous millennium. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a great pleasure to talk on, uh, on neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, a subject, as you say, very close to my heart. And the question that you've raised is, is it prime time? Is it ready to go? Oh, and just activation this. So just to set the scene, I think historically, uh, it's always worth looking at whether there is a need for something. And I like this. Uh, this is a graph of standard age mortality for colorectal cancer in the United Kingdom uh, from 1950 through to this millennium. And what it shows us is that there have been two big advances, one in the 50s to 60s and another one in the 90s to the 2000s. And the earlier one correlated with um, the, the introduction of safe anesthesia for colorectal cancer surgery. And the latter one correlated with the introduction of screening, early diagnosis, rapid access clinics. And I would say there is a huge need for the next advance. And I don't think our traditional approaches are actually going to provide that advance. I think the advance will come from neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And I'd like to put the case for that now. I was going to start with rectal cancer, and uh, there were two major trials. Uh, the first one was reported over 12 years ago. That was the CRO7, and here the TME trial from our Dutch colleagues, both randomized over two, over 1,000 patients each to preoperative radiotherapy versus uh, standard of care for rectal cancer. And both showed uh, absolutely that you could halve the local recurrence rate. But they also showed, and perhaps slightly surprisingly, that the overall survival rates were unchanged by this approach. And when you look at the data, you have to ask whether this is actually due to late side effects from the surgery and the radiotherapy actually detracting from the welfare of the patients. Uh, despite this, uh, actually, the oncology community decided to, ex to escalate the preoperative care. And I think that's an interesting question and one that we might discuss. But the Rapido trial, a great trial run by our Scandinavian colleagues, uh, randomized just under a thousand patients to an enhanced neoadjuvant uh, regimen with short course radiotherapy and six cycles of, of KPOX. And what they showed again is an incremental increase in the uh, uh, local clearance and reduction in uh, local recurrence and disease related treatment failure. But again, these trials did not show any benefit in overall survival. 
It's interesting that alongside this work on what is really advanced rectal cancer, there's been a parallel stream of work looking at neoadjuvant therapy for earlier rectal cancer. And this study by my colleague, Simon Bark, uh, the TREC study was published in the Lancet series uh, a couple of a year, a year ago now. And this small phase two study showed that you could safely randomize patients between radical surgery and organ preservation for early rectal cancer. And actually the results were very acceptable. And that work has now led them to run the Star Trek trial, which is a, a large phase three randomized control trial, really looking at the clinical pathways for uh, evaluating, avoiding radical surgery for this uh, group of rectal cancers. So what are the issues for neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, chemo and radiotherapy for rectal cancer? Well, at the moment, I think it's accepted use for advanced disease, particularly for that disease which we surgeons feel we're not really confident we can clear adequately uh, at a primary operation. And there is, of course, increased interest in early stage disease. And I think this is driven by a feeling that the radical surgery for this disease is not entirely justified because the large majority of these patients are going to be cured, uh, dare I say it, almost whatever you do. So actually a much more conservative approach may give a better quality of life and uh, better long-term outcomes for many patients. Despite this evidence, many surgeons would still choose to operate by preference if they felt they could resect a tumour. And it's interesting to wonder why this might be. I think there are two reasons that uh, surgeons uh, consider in this, ana in this analysis. The first is they worry about the early and late side effects, particularly of radiotherapy. But I think even more so, it's the lack of a predictable response. So we're almost setting the patients out on a kind of uncertain pathway. We don't know if their tumor is going to respond. We don't know if they're going to benefit from this. They might do, they might not. We're going to wait and see. And I don't think that's a very comfortable discussion for surgeons and oncologists to have with their patients. So what of colon cancer? Um, a very similar story, I think, actually, when you break it down to its elements, that the, the benefits and the hazards seem to be quite closely aligned. So I think you're all aware that we ran the Foxtrot trial, again, randomized over a thousand patients to three cycles of neoadjuvant combination chemotherapy followed by surgery versus uh, standard of care. And what we showed was first up is that we improved the resection and clearance of those tumors at the primary operation, just as we did with rectal cancer. Interestingly, the surgeons all said, yeah, but we, I don't need that because I do proper surgery, which is, of course is exactly what they said uh, when the rectal cancer papers were first published some uh, 15 years ago. Uh, the colon cancer study, uh, the Foxtrot trial has also shown a 25% reduction in uh, recurrence rates, and that was sustained over five years. Um, and that, that, that's very much in line with the findings in rectal cancer. This is a real biological effect as shown by a parallel reduction in the risk of death from colon cancer, though of course not reaching statistical significance. Interestingly, the risk of death from any cause, the overall survival, if you like, there is actually a clear trend towards improved overall survival, improved uh, risk of death from uh, following neoadjuvant chemotherapy for colon cancer. Now that might be because we're, you, we're giving systemic treatment rather than local treatment, wouldn't quite fit with the Rapido results, but it may also be actually that this neoadjuvant therapy is not adversely affecting the long-term outcomes of the patients. And this would seem to be the case because if we look at the perioperative complications from neoadjuvant chemotherapy in colon cancer, we see a very strong case for reduced 
anastomotic leak, reduced re redo surgery, and reduced compl complications from with prolonged hospital stay. And actually, this would this fits in with this overall benefit in terms of long term outcomes, and perhaps is a little guide for us when we're thinking about the development of neoadjuvant therapy in the future. So what is the progress for neoadjuvant chemotherapy in colon cancer? As I say, I think it's very similar to rectal cancer, but perhaps this short course of three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is actually less toxic, and that's something that might be valuable going forward. The other thing that's interesting is it predicts outcome. I just want to show you this slide. This is the hist blinded histological assessment of the tumors following neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And what it shows very clearly is that if you have a good response to th even just three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, your long-term recurrence rates are very low. However, if you don't have a response, then your recurrence rates, excuse me, <coughs> your recurrence rates rise up towards 30% in this group, clearly identifying a group of patients for whom perhaps we need to consider alternative therapies because our current therapies are not as effective as we would like to see. I would just emphasize that this is actually a, uh, uh, for looking at the data, this is an effect, is a response to chemotherapy, not an intrinsic tumor uh, characteristic, which is most interesting and perhaps a little surprising, but very useful. Because what it implies is that we're actually perhaps giving the wrong chemotherapy to this group of patients who are not responding. And an alternative um, approach to, the, to therapy is clearly required. So what are the challenges around um, what are the challenges around delivering neoadjuvant chemotherapy for rectal cancer and, and colon cancer? And I think one of them we have to acknowledge is the demonstration of, of overall survival benefit. And at the moment that is lacking. The other challenge is the concern that whenever you give therapy before surgery, you're at risk of over treatment. And that's shown across all sorts of different uh, cancer types. Uh, I think the other risk is that you end up escalating therapy. And that is a challenge. And I think that that's already happened in rectal cancer. And what we see there is you get marginal gains, but you also have increased toxicity. And I'm not convinced that that is the right way to go. I think we need to enrich the population of responders by actually identifying the non-responders to therapy. And if we can identify non-responders to therapy, as I just showed you in the histological assessment, then those patients can be given alternative treatment. One very clear example for enriching for responders is seen uh, from the Foxtrot trial, which is the results of mismatch repair analysis. If you look at mismatch repair proficient tumors, which was just under 80% of the cancers treated in Foxtrot, then actually this population had a nearly 30% reduction in recurrence rates over two years. Uh, and, and that, even though that's a smaller population, that's still significant. And the reason that is having such a benefit is that the mismatch repair deficient tumors, the DMMR tumors, they, they actually have shown uh, no effect at all from uh, giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They seem to be completely resistant to this treatment modality. And that, that, is, that has now been shown in gastric cancer. And I think the implication is that these tumors are probably resistant to standard chemotherapy and an alternative strategy is needed. But I think the principle of this is really important. And that is that we should be enriching the responsive population. So what of transitioning to neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Where are we on the road? I think we need to be more careful about the assessment of safety. I think we didn't do that very well with the rectal cancer work and it could be done better. And we need to look at the impact of neoadjuvant therapy on surgical recovery. I would have to say the colon cancer work is very encouraging in that respect. Improving risk stratification is clearly very powerful and response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a good guide as to how we might manage patients post-operatively and might actually reduce us giving chemotherapy in the future. 
I think enriching the population for response, excuse me, <coughs> excuse, um, uh, for example, by excluding patients with mismatch repair deficient tumors is a very powerful way forward. And there are many people, including the uh, escort group and also Andrew Beggs, Professor Beggs, my colleague, are looking at panel signatures that might define groups that are not going to respond to this approach and alternative approaches are required. And I think all of this is actually taking us down a, the path of colorectal cancer being a rare disease. So no longer are we going to give a standardized therapy to all the patients. We're actually going to be giving a personalized therapy to patients dependent on their particular tumor type. Where are we in this uh, pathway? We're, we're moving down it. Foxtrot 2 and 3 are funded by the Yorkshire Cancer Research. And these two trials are looking at two separate questions. Foxtrot 2 is looking at frail patients, patients who maybe <coughs> won't be suitable for post-operative chemotherapy. And they are being randomized to neoadjuvant therapy versus standard of care. For the younger, fitter patients, we are offering a randomization between uh, oxaloplatin and 5-FU versus folfoxiri but only for six weeks. We're not lengthening the course because I think that that will increase toxicity. These, these treatment options are only being offered for mismatch repair proficient tumours. For mismatch repair deficient tumours, we need to look at alternative strategies. And I'm sure everyone in the room is aware that uh, immunotherapy is showing great benefits for these patients. And the recent NISH trial has already shown a 60% pathological complete response rate for these tumors in the neoadjuvant setting it was with a combined two, two, two types of drug in the neoadjuvant setting. So a very exciting opportunity for the DMMR tumors, separating them out from traditional therapeutic uh, di direction. And what I would say is we're now looking at another separate group we're looking at is the um, BRAF mutant tumors, and we're looking at BRAF inhibitors in the neoadjuvant setting. So Foxtrot 4 and 5 are already being set up, and this is dividing colon cancer into very into smaller separate groups. My view is the same needs to probably be done for rectal cancer, and maybe that's a point for discussion. We have a great team working on this project. It's a great pleasure to be part of it. We have international collaborators from all over the world, <coughs> looking at the translational program especially and we're also looking at this uh, strategy in a global context including the global south in india and nigeria as well as collaborators in the southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere so i think there's a very exciting opportunity to transform the care for colon cancer and make a huge advance in terms of uh, benefits and overall survival from disease and uh, it's a great pleasure to be undertaking this journey so Yes, I do think prime time has arrived. Thank you very much. Dion, thank you. That was an absolute uh, tour de force. Um, I've always felt that colorectal cancer management has been many years behind that of breast cancer in terms of the individualization of the treatment and the options that we have available. And I think that really in the last kind of five to 10 years, that's really changed. Um, before uh, questions come in from the uh, from the audience, I might ask, why do you think the complication rate you observed post-operatively was lower uh, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Uh, you know, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. The easy answer is to say, well, we shrank the tumours down so the surgery was easier. Uh, do I believe that answer? No. <laughs> um I think if you really want, I think it's by better preoperative preparation. So obviously I wouldn't say this in public, but because we're in private, nobody's listed, you know, I'll just say, but what I would say is that I think actually giving our patients the oncologists for a couple of months or six weeks to look after while they optimize them medically and give them the chemotherapy, that actually prepared those patients better for their surgery. So it was actually a preoperative workup that was, I think, partly to uh, cause that. I mean, of course, there are other nuanced uh, uh, reasons, modulation of the immune response, even a bit of immune dampening can help people through major surgery. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to oversimplify, but I, I, it, it has made me think very hard 
about preoperative optimization for our patients, particularly in colorectal surgery, where Kieran emphasized, you know, an awful lot of our patients get major complications because of sepsis and their ability to deal with it. So maybe we really should be working harder to optimize our patients. But look, John, that's a personal view, and I, I, I would be, I wouldn't fight a corner for it. But, um, but that is my thinking around it at the moment. Fascinating. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, did you uh, observe any obstructions during new adjuvant treatment? Yes, we did. Uh, it was it, there were there were obstructive episodes in about four uh, percent of patients, about one in thirty patients. Um, that they actually were very mild, and the, I think the threshold for defining obstruction was very low. As you can imagine, if you're a if you're looking after if patients got colic or tummy upsets, they worried about obstruction. They went to theatre. So actually, when we looked and we've, there's a publication coming out uh, in the BJS uh, looking at the obstructed group, and that group of patients have been analysed, and actually their outcomes are remarkably good, really, really very good. So again, I think it's because they're already being monitored and they're already being they're within the hospital system. So their outcomes are much better than we would have expected. Um, and just one final question uh, in the efforts of keeping to time. Um, is this now the, the standard of care in your unit? I, I, I think the, the, the person posing the question probably finds it the same in my unit is that, you, you know, we know the literature is there and it's an effort to try and convince our oncology colleagues of the safety of this practice. Um, so. Yeah, I think the oncologists are worried about overtreatment, uh, which is, I think, they're right to. I would worry about overtreatment too. I, I emphasise to them that actually 90% of patients getting adjuvant chemotherapy get no benefit. And if that's not overtreatment, I don't know what is. Um, yes, it is standard of care in Leeds and in Birmingham. And uh, it is widely used and patients are routinely put into this pathway. Um, uh, I, I think increasingly around the world, people are using it. Of course, we use it selectively where we're worried about the patients. I actually suspect we should be using it far more widely than we currently do because the safety is so good. Um, could I just apologize for coughing? But I'm afraid I picked up COVID yesterday. So I, I'm just struggling a little bit today. But uh, apologies to everyone for that. Not at all. Well, Dion, thank you again. And, you know, you're to be congratulated on enabling us to, to convince our, our colleagues to, to start this form of treatment and improve outcomes for our patients. Well, we'll look forward to people collaborating with us on Foxtrot 2, 3, 4, 5. Seriously, because they're, they're going to go across the world now. So it's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to our, our next speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Roel Homs, who is a consultant surgeon at the uh, University Medical Center in Amsterdam. Roel graduated from uh, the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium in 2002, and after training in Belgium, completed two fellowships in the UK uh, in Oxford and Basingstoke, and was appointed to Oxford before moving back to the AMC in 2017. His clinical interests include the surgical management of colorectal cancer, particularly rectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, and surgical complications. Roll is at the forefront of safe surgical innovation and is one of the early pioneers of transanal TME. He established the TA TME registry and continues to hold leadership roles in the proctorship of this technique for which he has been awarded a PhD, innumerable publications, awards, and is a frequent keynote speaker. TA TME is an operation that for which I am very passionate about uh, and in terms of its advantages. And I look forward to hearing him speak on how to demonstrate benefit but maintain standards in surgical innovation for rectal cancer. Thank you, Rol. Well, thank you, Professor Burke, for the kind introduction and the invitation. Uh, and my disclosure is, is that we probably share the same passion about this, uh, this technique. Uh, and I'm really grateful for this, uh, this uh, talk title because it made you sort of reflect on what we've done, what, we've co what we could have done better uh, and uh, what the, our current practice is and how we keep it safe. 
And when we introduce new technology, I think we're now all aware there's this framework that allows for a safe introduction, but also how to make it reproducible. And with each step in this evolution, we need to carefully assess what we've done. And I think we as early adopters uh, try to adhere to this uh, framework as good as we could, uh, particularly in the development phase, uh, but definitely also in the exploration phase, where we put a lot of effort into learning. And currently we're sort of uh, uh, at the assessment phase where the randomized control trials are ongoing. Well, I think we're all aware about uh, this uh, moratorium that uh, was put on TATME in Norway. Uh, and the question here, uh, of course, they saw local recurrences, which were multifocal. Is this really technique related or is this related to poor implementation? And when you then dig into the data, it's a four year period they collected this data from, from seven hospitals, actually only four did a reasonable volume of cases. But we look at the total volume, it was only less than 10 cases per center per year. Uh, only one center received proper mentoring, while we don't have any information how long that mentoring was uh, received. We have no information about the prerequisites, no information in this publication on complications and perspiring uh, failures. And I have questions about the case selection, Hartman's procedure. I find that a very difficult procedure to do with TATME, brings you into a different type of plane. They did completion salvage procedures, which again, distorts your plane. So not ideally within your learning curve. And I would say that the majority of these centers were still in their learning curve. They selected their patients reasonably well and that you saw that the, the new adjuvant treatment given was lower than the national average. But if you don't give chemotherapy, then your surgical technique needs to be perfect. And when you have a CRM positivity rate, of 13.4% with seven rectal perforations, I can hardly call that a good surgical technique. So has this raised a concern? Yes, uh, multifocal local recurrences, but I also have concerns about their training pathway, their case selection, case volume, and also their surgical quality. So what went wrong if we think that we went along the ideal framework very well. I think that we moved too quickly, actually from the development phase to the exploration phase. The technique was not perfect, uh, well, well, properly established yet before we actually went into the exploration phase. And within that exploration phase, I think it moved too quickly from the early adopters to the early majority. And that came sort of in, to late 2014, 2015, where the, really that hype started. And this is an old slide from a presentation I gave at that point. And I sort of already raised at that point concerns about too rapid introduction and particularly the lack of guidelines, uh, the lack of how we could select patients well for this technique and a proper training pathway. So that's 2014, 15, that it really started uh, uh, taking uh, higher volumes uh, all across the world. And when we, I think we did a good job of establishing a well uh, executed and also with an educationalist, uh, well, properly designed training pathway, but that was only ready uh, at the end of 2019, properly ready to put into clinical practice. So well beyond when uh, the hype started. Similarly, about proper patient prediction, this is data from the TATME registry, where we had a multivariate analysis looking at risk factors on a, a huge amount of patients that predicted a positive margin. And this allowed us to predict the model uh, based on these risk factors for obtaining a positive margin. And this can help surgeons to decide which cases they would select for the learning curve. And even if you go even to the more red uh, figures, think about intensifying new adjuvant treatment, like we just uh, heard in the previous talk from Professor Morton, and of course, think about an extended TME beyond TME. But again, this was not ready until 2019. Similar for guidance statements, the, uh, the uh, ESCP guidance statement only came out in 2020, but also the Canadian 
statement only in 2020. And these, particularly the ESCP statement, that was with multiple societies. And that's the difficulty when you're trying to do this worldwide. I think the Canadian uh, statement is actually properly better because you're then dealing with one insurance system. Uh, there's not different legal issues in different countries. And this is something that I think we could have done better to keep better control of um, diffusion of this technique by regulating it nationally. And I think that sort of where it lacked a bit. And I would like to show what we've done here in the Netherlands. And this is from uh, Mark Besseling's work, uh, an HPB surgeon here at uh, our institution. He ran the Leopard 2 trial. And the Leopard 2 trial is a trial where they randomized uh, laparoscopic versus open uh, pancreatic uh, head resections. And he actually with an interim safety analysis stopped the trial because of an increased mortality. And he also saw that they couldn't reach uh, the primary endpoints anyway. And in the aftermath of that, they sort of brought all the surgeons together and watched at the videos and saw there was actually a technical issue with some of the patients that uh, succumbed to the procedure. And they reached an agreement that no one would do further laparoscopic pancreatic duodenectomies. And this is not something that was implied by the national government. No, these are HPB surgeons within the Dutch Pancreatic Cancer Workgroup that decided we're not gonna do this anymore. We're gonna set up a robotic training program, start in two high volume centers, and then only train uh, other centers that have a proper volume of, uh, of uh, uh, Ripple procedures. And now 2022, they've already trained eight high volume, sorry, eight high volume centers, uh, up to uh, 550 robotic pancreatic duodenectomies have been safely performed in the Netherlands without any mortality and again, increased the rate of minimally invasive surgery for pancreatic duodenectomies. And again, the rate of laparoscopic pancreatic duodenectomies has decreased to 1%. So the good thing that we have here in the Netherlands that we also can do a proper audit uh, also of our colorectal procedures. And this is the Dutch colorectal audit. And this is a mandatory registry. It's independently audited. And also we did that for uh, transanal TME. So we collected three years worth of data and we did a one-to-one -one matched analysis uh, for laparoscopic restorative TME versus TA TME. And you can already see here, one of the issues that we had is that we didn't properly control it also here in the Netherlands, the diffusion of the technique. 38 centers started TA TME. We have only eight, well, a lot of centers, only a very, small uh, case volume experience of less than five and actually 15 uh, got some sort of structured proctoring. You can see here that with only three centers above 60 cases, so three centers uh, sort of mitigated their learning curve. And what you can see here in the match cohort, that actually morbidity, anastomotic leak rate, length of stay, CRM positivity rate was similar for laparoscopic versus TATME but with a lower conversion rate for TATME. In the unmatched cohort, you can see that morbidity was actually higher for the TATME group, anastomotic leak rate was higher in the TATME group, and also length of stay was higher. And this is because if you look at which cases they selected uh, with threatened margins, lower tumors than in the laparoscopic group, so potentially patients that would benefit from a TATME approach but not when you're in your learning curve. So this is already something that alerted us. And when we looked at case centers that actually received some form of training, here you can question about some of the case selections as there were two D4 tumors in there, uh, six patients were actually still a threatened margin after new action treatment. Again, not the ideal cases uh, for your learning curve. And although they had good short-term oncological outcomes, we did see also a local recurrence rate of 10%, with two thirds being multifocal. And that really raised alarm bells. And at that point, did we then stop as we did in Norway? No, we brought together the work group of color proctology. So this uh, entails 
all the colorectal surgeons within the Netherlands. Uh, and we had a big TATME debate in 2019. And there we decided no new centers would be trained. We would be carefully monitoring, auditing the data that we had up to that point, quality control of those units that were still learning, uh, advocate participation in the color tree trial, the randomized control trial, and not put centralization for low rectal cancer definitely on the agenda. And what we saw after that, we went back to those centers with the initial publication where we had the 10% local recurrence rate. And we looked at the four centers that proceeded carefully, monitored, uh, uh, trained. And we saw that actually the local recurrence rates decreased with increasing experience. And this is data from six higher volume centers. And there we could see that experience is indeed the most significant risk factor for these local recurrences. And it occurs during le your learning curve. And this is of course important when we start training new centers in the future, that this is uh, uh, mitigated and by proper training programs and auditing. We also looked at results of TATME procedures and centers beyond the learning curve and compare that to laparoscopic approaches and centers beyond the learning curve and robotic outcomes. And again, these are all uh, MRI defined uh, rectal cancers. Uh, so that's uh, a cohort of 1,617 patients. And the results were comparable, except that we saw higher rates of uh, restorative procedures in both the TATME arm and the robotic arm. We also saw that permanent stoma rate at long-term follow-up was lower for robotic and TATME with uh, comparable uh, long-term, uh, intermediate term, you should say, uh, oncological outcomes. We also looked at particularly low rectal cancer and MRI defined low rectal cancer, which uh, entailed a group of 600 patients. And this is of course where the robot and also TA to me uh, should uh, really perform better than laparoscopy. And here you could see that when it comes to restorative procedures, the highest rate of restorative procedures in all comers in these centers was for TATME at 50% and one third for robotic uh, uh, TMEs compared to only one in four for laparoscopic procedures. And really interesting that in laparoscopic expert centers there was actually an intraoperative management change in 10% of patients compared to 2% for TATME. And that intraoperative change was predominantly from going from a restorative procedure to a definitive colostomy. So I think this is quite uh, important data that again shows that when you look at all the other short-term uh, features, we are performing a safe procedure for TATME. And also when you look again at the intermediate outcomes for uh, uh, TATME, these are comparable to the other two minimally invasive approaches. What was the national impact after the TAT immediate uh, in 2020? So we started off with 38 centers. Uh, uh, probably now we have only 21 centers that still perform TAT, which seems to be concentrating itself to seven high volume centers. Uh, we still have 11 centers that perform low volume, and these will probably stop doing this procedure. And we have five centers that are uh, doing reasonable volume per year, but probably will need to decide which way they will go, whether or not they will participate with this technique or will give this uh, technique up and, and move uh, either to uh, robotics or laparoscopy. And of course, we promote uh, uh, participation in the color tree trial, where we carefully also uh, use a platform for surgical quality assessment. So the MRIs are uploaded, but also the videos are uploaded. And with a critical assessment tool, we assess each video whether or not adequate uh, surgical quality is assured. And I'm pleased to say that the interim analysis was done last year uh, and there were no difference in serious adverse events. And also great to see that there was no difference in local recurrence rate and particularly no multifocal local recurrences. So we're recruiting well, and I, I think uh, at the end of, hopefully at the end of next year, uh, we'll be able to uh, complete uh, recruitment. 
So my conclusions are that how we assured here in the Netherlands uh, uh, to keep it safe and assure high quality uh, for TAT meat procedures is at some point we did a careful audit and made a decision together uh, that we would not train any new centers. Uh, we would continue only uh, with centers that demonstrated uh, competency and offered further training and mentoring in those centers still going through the learning curve. High volume is crucial to do this uh, technique well, uh, and we encourage everyone for safe performance uh, of the ATM even in the safety of a trial. And we hope to finish the color tree trial uh, very soon to give uh, definitive uh, outcomes on TATME. But again, I think the most important aspect is what we've learned is, is that uh, A, we moved again too quickly um, and we need to put more effort in training centers properly and doing this uh, with strict guidance. And I think the best way to ensure that is to do that on a, on a national level. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ro. That was a, a fantastic overview of this technology from inception to, to where it is now. Um, I remember uh, early on in its dissemination, Matt Albert was given a talk and demonstrating that technique. And an audience member goes, you make that look easy. And in the audience was the person that trained him on fellowship, who was Randy Bailey. And he said, well, the truth is Matt makes everything look easy. And I think a lot of those that pioneered the operation were outstanding, minimally invasive technical surgeons. And the result is that it probably looked a little bit easier than it was. Um, with that in mind, who do you think should start doing the operation now? I, 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 I remember uh, having seen Matt doing this operation. Unfortunately, never said on stage it was easy. I always said it's a very complex technique, but you need to be good at, at, at minimally invasive skills. So you, you need some prerequisites actually to do this. Um, I, I think to start off with a fellowship, I think we have fellows that, uh, that we train. So it's good to pick it up as, as a fellowship, but not to start off your minimally invasive uh, career in TATME. So you start off with getting acquainted with, with laparoscopy, minimally invasive surgery, or robotic surgery, because it's still a hybrid procedure. Part of the procedure is still done uh, uh, for the uh, transabdominal phase by laparoscopy or robotic surgery. And then you move to the transanal work where we start them off with doing local excision through a TAMS platform. And we have an IBD practice where if you do pouches, it's a close rectal dissection. That is perfect to get your bearings. Uh, and that amalgamation of minimally invasive experience with transanal experience uh, then puts you at a, at a really good point to start doing TA to me. And as mentioned, Within, within, like say in the Netherlands, I think it's gonna concentrate itself into seven units and not more. We don't need more centers offering TATME. And if you can see that we offer actually more restorative surgery with less change of intraoperative management, I think it comes down to having that discussion with your patient. If you're only offering that broscopy, if that patient really wants uh, for his low rectal cancer restorative surgery and you can't offer him that, refer them to either a TATME center or a robotic center, in my opinion. And for me, I think one of the real benefits is it makes you very comfortable and facile operating transanally for juxtaanal tumors um, in a way that you previously weren't comfortable with before. Um, and, that's, and that's the crux of the procedure, that lower part of the dissection. And it's so unfortunately that in Norway, but also I think in the UK with the ACP GBI statement, they sort of stop a good technique, not just for rectal cancer, but for IBD, for managing pelvic sepsis. It's so much more than just a technique to deal with the complex rectal cancer. And do you see its future then in centralizing not only the operation, but in the management of lower third tumors? I mean, is that where you're going to in the Netherlands or? I think so, yeah. I think the whole, the whole 
discussion that we had and what is the role for TA to me really brought forward a, dis a big discussion that we need to have about who will be managing uh, MRI defined lower rectal cancer because we now have a good definition of what is a rectal cancer, the sigmo takeoff. We've evaluated that. I think it sort of uh, reduces the number by 10%. And then when you have sort of MRI defined rectal cancer, those are cancers where we now have, in my opinion, better techniques than laparoscopy via either robot or TA to me. And that I think needs, uh, needs also centralization. Super. Well, Rod, thank you again for your time. That was really enjoyable. Um, lastly, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Stan Goldberg, who is um, in the air, I understand at the moment, but has pre-recorded his presentation. Uh, Professor Goldberg is a graduate uh, of medical school from the University of Minnesota in 1956 and completed his surgical and colorectal training there and carried out a fellowship in St. Mark's Hospital before returning to his alma mater. His clinical interests included all facets of coloproctology, but in particular proctology itself and surgical education. In 1972, he's appointed the chief of his division and under his leadership over the next 20 years, the practice grew to be one of the largest uh, colorectal specialty groups in the world with an enduring reputation. His honors and awards are too numerous to mention, um, but include and are not limited to past president of the American Society of Colorectal Surgery. Prof Goldberg has truly the 5,000 foot view of the techniques that have come and gone in colorectal disease. And with this in mind, uh, I've asked for his perspective on the perianal fistula. Have new techniques improved outcome? Thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation uh, to present uh, this presentation on the perianal fistula have new techniques, improved outcomes. I could make this very, very short by saying the answer is no, except for one, but I will just go through a few of the points that uh, I would like to make. First of all, thank you ever so much for including uh, me. I bring you regards from the um, land of sky blue waters in Minnesota. I have no disclosures. And this is just a brief outline of what I intend to cover. I realize that some of it is pretty basic, but I think I'll make uh, the point of where we are today in fistula surgery. As you all know, the best treatment is prevention and draining the abscess is the key. And we teach all of our uh, residents and registrars uh, to drain the abscess adequately. And we work in the prone jackknife position, uh, which makes it convenient. Uh, we have these marvelous tables which put the patient in the proper position to do anal rectal surgery. And 90% of our abscesses are drained right in the clinic under local anesthesia, as you see pictured here. We have a little electrocoagulator handy to handle all the superficial bleeders. And as is outlined in this slide, you can see the uncomplicated ones are all managed in the clinic, whereas the complicated ones um, we more than likely will take to the uh, theater to operate on them at that point. A question always comes up whether you should culture the purulent material. We did that for many years. We have given it up. It really hasn't proven, uh, it hasn't uh, <clears throat> shown any benefit, so we don't bother culturing any longer. The question comes up as to who gets antibiotics, and uh, unfortunately, in all the clinics in the United States, they're still throwing antibiotics around like water. Uh, we feel very strongly that uh, <clears throat> there is a limited number of patients who should be given antibiotics following the drainage of an abscess. I have a brief outline listed here, primarily patients with valvular heart disease or anybody who's got a prosthetic device in place. Obviously, if um, they have an extensive cellulitis or they're immunosuppressed, we feel they ought to be on antibiotics. As far as the follow-up following the drainage of an abscess, we see them in the clinic uh, in approximately 10 days and with a pediatric anoscope. And you'll notice I underlined no probing. Uh, I think uh, uh, too many fistula, fistulas have been created by unnecessary probing under anesthesia and in the operating room and in the clinic. 
But just a word about the common uh, abscesses that we see. As you all know, the most common ones are the ischiorectal abscess and the perianal abscess. And the rare one is the intramuscular abscess. The supralevator abscess, I have to be honest, is extremely rare. Personally, I think a lot of it is iatrogenic. Uh, however, I think a significant number of them are related to uh, abscesses related to perforated diverticular disease, a ruptured appendix, or salpingo uv or um, salpingitis. Anyhow, a word also about the management of an ischiorectal abscess. We are all taught to go, put our finger into the abscess cavity and break down all the loculations. Unfortunately, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize that when you go ahead and do such a thing, there's a certain structure sitting right in the ischiorectal fossa and it's listed and I'm pointing to it right here. It is the inferior rectal artery. And if you put your finger in and drain that ischiorectal abscess by breaking down all the loculations, don't be surprised if you create a little hemorrhagic problem for yourself by tearing the inferior rectal arteries. So be alert of that. And it really isn't necessary to break down all the loculations. Once you open it to the outside, more than likely uh, nature will take care of the rest. In terms of the diagnosis of an intersphincteric abscess, this is a rare situation where you're gonna find an abscess in the intersphincteric space and by just doing a circumanal palpation, there's nothing on the outside, no redness, no swelling, nothing like that. And uh, all of a sudden you'll see an area where the patient will say it's tender there. And if, if you'll just put a little pressure here on the perianal skin, uh, this abscess will identify itself. However, today, uh, anybody with rectal pain in, in our situation goes to the scanner immediately. So the majority of these today are being, are being uh, diagnosed by the uh, CT scanner. In the operating room to treat it, very simple, usually the, uh, internal the internal sphincter is very attenuated over this abscess and you can just drain it right back into the anal canal. But what we're here to really talk about today is the classic fistula in ano. And as you all know, colorectal surgeons for years have been trying to um, cure the anal, uh, cure this condition without division of the sphincter muscle. So the core principles, when you think about it, we wanna repair the fistula, we wanna preserve continence and obviously prevent recurrence. Now this data, uh, you all recognize the picture of Sir Alan Parks. And this data was gathered 40 or 50 years ago. And as you probably know, Sir Alan had quite a referral practice from all over the, uh, all over the world. And so really his data doesn't really reflect what we see today. Today, the majority of patients that we see are either type one or type two. Rarely do we see a type three. And I have to be honest with you, except in very, very rare circumstances, are you gonna see a type four? So primarily, it is the intersphincteric abscess and the transphincteric abscess and the supralevator abscess, I think primarily are related to uh, poor probing at the time of the drainage of the abscess. So what are our indications? They're listed here, continual drainage. And question, what guides our management? I've listed it here. It depends on the etiology of the fistula. Is it simple? Is it complex? And their sphincter function. And what are the patient's expectations? <clears throat> Now, the clinical approach, obviously, we got to confirm the diagnosis. We got to exclude uh, other pathology, uh, primarily Crohn's disease. And you'll notice the last point here, document continence. If the surgeon will only document the continence before the operation, because if there's any alteration in continence after the operation, the surgeon's going to be blamed for it. So always document the, continent, the continence of the patient. And I do this, I have a simple little GLS, uh, gas, liquid stool, solid stool, GLS. And I ask the patient preoperatively, and I put this in my notes, so it's in there before the surgery, because any incontinence that the patient has postoperatively is going to be blamed on the surgeon. So <clears throat> some of the, the critical questions when you're dealing with a fistula 
has to do with how much muscle is involved. And there's several ways to evaluate this. And you'll notice that I have probe under anesthesia gently that I have this in yellow, because I really think that there's too vigorous probing around the anal canal. And I think a lot of the, the complicated fistulas that we see are iatrogenic. We rely uh, most commonly on endorectal ultrasound and MRI. MRI is more expensive, but endoanal ultrasound can be a very, is a very simple technique. And here you can see a simple fistula located here. It's 2D. We also have uh, here, you can put a little hydrogen peroxide into the, into the tract and see it, it lights up like a Christmas tree. And now we also have 3D ultrasound that we use. On the other hand, we also have MRI, which is more expensive. On the other hand, uh, the majority of, of patients are evaluated with MRI today. However, in specialty clinics, we do have endoanal ultrasound. And as you can see in this study, as you compare the, uh, the endorectal ultrasound with the MRI, looking for the primary tract, not bad. Internal opening, not bad. So there's no question that endorectal ultrasound is cheaper, can be reproduced, can use it in the operating room. I prefer it. However, the majority of patients today in the United States are being evaluated with an MRI. Now, when you approach a patient with fistula and anal, obviously you got to confirm the diagnosis and once again, document their continence, uh, which is critical preoperatively. Now, in terms of new procedures, I've just listed some of them here. Uh, there are others that are out there. The lay open technique has been around for a thousand years. Primary sphincter repair, I've never done. I don't think it's necessary to in the, in the low uh, fistulas that we operate on. Putting in a draining seton, you're all familiar with. The cutting seton, we gave that up 20 years ago. However, it is still being used in certain parts of the world. Sliding flaps are still very popular in Europe. However, they're becoming less popular in the United States and I believe less popular in Europe as well. Fibrin glue came and went, worthless. Collagen plugs, I got sucked in on this, terrible. Uh, we've given it up completely. Stem cells, just one study, I'll show it to you later. And the, using a laser, uh, I'll comment on that later as well. But the procedure I'm gonna spend a certain amount of time on is the lift operation. When you look at surgical techniques, you've got the simple fistulotomy, you can do a fistulectomy and a cutting seton. These are all sphincter sacrificing procedures. When you look at sphincter preserving procedures, as I said, fibrin glue is worthless, plugs have been proven to be worthless, stem cells, little or no data to support that. The lift operation we'll focus on, the laser technique, uh, once again, very little data, video assisted, forget about it. Advancement flaps have a, have a role, but very it's becoming less frequent that we use advancement flaps. Adding a little uh, uh, bio lift by adding a piece of mesh doesn't make any sense. We don't do it. Platelet rich fibrin sealant, very expensive and has not, ad not added anything. Just a brief word about the laser. There's multiple um, series out there, but if you'll notice whenever they, they put the laser in and they destroy the track, but they always close the internal opening. And if, if you do nothing but just close the internal opening, you're gonna get about a 35 to 40% success rate. So um, we need a prospective randomized trial laser versus non-laser of the track and see if it really makes a difference. As far as stem cells, as you can see, there's very little data out there that really show this is the only prospective randomized trial. You can see there is a benefit, but once again, uh, I can see it's very expensive and uh, I don't think that this is gonna add anything to the management of, of uh, fistula and anal. And the same thing can be said about platelet rich plasma. If you look at the prospective randomized trial done here uh, by my friend down in Egypt, you'll see that adding platelet rich plasma does not improve the rate of healing. Flaps, there's no question that there's, uh, when you look at all the uh, techniques, of, all the papers on flap procedures, it depends on where cetons use, what is the thickness of the flap, the size of the flap, did they add glue, did they add a plug, did they use diversion? There's all kinds of uh, variability uh, in, in the, uh, when you start analyzing the flap techniques. Uh, and I really think that 
flaps are going to play less and less of a role in the management of uh, fistula surgery in the future. <clears throat> so in conclusion about flaps, and a rectal flap, it's a good option. It's, it's better if you're going to, if you are going to do it, use a full thickness flap, flap. But whenever you mobilize the internal sphincter, you are going to get a, uh, there's going to be a degree of incontinence associated with it. But the operation I really want to spend some time on because I really think this has changed the whole uh, management of fistula and anal is the lift operation. And <clears throat> a little history, uh, as you may know, uh, Professor Robin Phillips from St. Mark's Hospital <clears throat> back in 1993, and I remember reading this article quite a few years ago, excuse me, and I wasn't sure what exactly he was doing, but as you see here, taken right from his drawing, you'll see that he went up in the inner sphincteric space right here and closed off the fistula between the internal and external sphincter, and this is, as far as I'm concerned, is the first recording of a uh, closure of the internal of, of the uh, fistulous tract. And you'll see his results really weren't bad. 54%, a small number of cases, very difficult suprasphincteric and transphincteric fistulas, but he came up with a 54% success rate. However, this is the man who really deserves all the credit. Uh, it's Dr. It's Professor Arun Razana Zakul in Thailand. And uh, if I had time, I would tell you the story how I got introduced to this, but make a long story short, in uh, 2007, he presented his initial series with 18 or 19, 18 patients with no recurrence. And as you all know, we do everything in, in the prone jackknife position. We do not operate in the lithotomy position except in rare occasions. And when we can't put somebody prone in the operating table, we'll use left lateral rather than uh, lithotomy. Here's a patient with a horseshoe abscess, drained, marsupialized, and we put a seton in and we'll wait for all that to heal in before we will attack this patient and do our lift operation. Now, if you're gonna do the lift operation, <clears throat> you gotta have the proper instruments. And I think as I look at the videos that I see on the internet, uh, this is what uh, is alarming, is the way they're trying to do this operation. As I say, you gotta have a Lone Star retractor, you gotta have a Pratt bivalve, you gotta have a right angle, a pediatric right angle, you have, you have to be able to have some hydrogen peroxide, Lockhart mummery probes. We use a UR6 needle to close the uh, fistulous tracts, but you've got to have exposure and that is key. Uh, the, <clears throat> and I close that with a 3.0 Vicryl and uh, you, ha you have to test the closure. Make sure it is watertight at the end of the procedure. So here's some diagrams, which I'm sure you've all seen. Here's the external opening of the fistulous tract. Here's the inner sphincteric space. Here's the internal opening. You have to identify the tract in the inner sphincteric space, and then you have to ligate it. Some people do a simple ligation. I over sew these with my UR6 needle, and then I enlarge the external opening and curette the external opening, and then close the incision. A very simple operation, but a few little tricks. First of all, we're at the operating table and I usually put my Pratt bivalve in and I identify this, the space between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter. And once I've done that, I then put my probe in and I take my seton out. And here's another picture. You see the external opening over here on the left. Here's the internal opening. I've marked exactly where I wanna go to get into the inner sphincteric space. Here we are in the inner sphincteric space. As you can see, my Lone Star retractor. I've also put in some local anesthesia with epinephrine. And here's the fistulous tract identified beautifully. I have two right angle, pediatric right angle clamps in order to dissect that right underneath the, uh, and here's another view of the same thing. Here's the external opening. Here's the probe in the anal canal. And here is the fistulous tract right in front of your nose. Here is the internal sphincter muscle. Here's the external sphincter muscle. And once you've ligated it, you just close the wound and you, you enlarge the external opening for drainage. <clears throat> and if you think about it, anytime you close a fistulous connection with the gastrointestinal tract, the fistula heals, whether it's in the esophagus, whether it's in the stomach, whether it's in the small intestine, the large intestine, it just makes so much sense and this knowledge has been around for a long time. However, the man who really uh, showed us the way, as I said, was uh, 
Professor Rosanna Zakul. And this is his uh, uh, original, uh, his latest study, 87% success rate with a median follow-up of six years. And the failures that he had, this is taken right from his article. You'll see he's got an 87.7% overall success rate, but his failures were all high transphenteric or horseshoe fistulas and the like, or bilateral horseshoe fistulas. This, this is where his failures were initially. But overall, he's got almost a 90% success rate with this position. Once again, technique, preoperative seton, we like to leave it in for two to three months to get a nice track to work with. We work in the prone jackknife position. We use the Lone Star retractor. We identify the inner sphincteric plane with a minimal amount of dissection. We suture ligate it, and this is key. At the end, we test all the closures with the lute hydrogen peroxide under pressure, and they have to be watertight before we finish the operation. So what's going on in the United States today? This is a paper taken from uh, the New England group of surgeons, 16 colorectal surgeons collected their data over several years. And you'll notice that the majority of them are using the healing, are using the lift procedure. Flap procedures are still being used. There's still an occasional plug put in. I don't know how, why they're still doing it. Uh, and fistulotomy for low fistulas is obvious, but anything above a low transphink, a low intersphincteric fistula is being treated primarily with the lift operation. If you look at uh, per, uh, <clears throat> Professor Rosanna Zakol's latest data, 99.2% success rate. Here's his 94% success rate with his original paper. I think I've gone over most of these points. Success is determined clinically. These were not all proven with MRI. And when you look at failures, you can have just a little sinus in the lift site. That just requires a little local treatment. You may end up with an inner sphincteric fistula, which is simple. That needs just a simple fistulotomy for the, uh, the inner sphincteric fistula. If you have a transphincteric fistula recurrence, then you're obviously gonna have to repeat it with another lift operation in three months or resort to an advancement flap technique. I think people should report their results. I think that they should talk about success. Uh, I don't think MRI is required to prove success. I think if the wound never heals, I think that's a failure. If they actually do heal and then recur, I think we got to call that a recurrence. So I think we should start using the proper terminology as to really how we report our results. Number one, it's an operation that is very easy to learn and perform and with minimal or no impact on continence. Now, is there a role for the lift operation in Crohn's disease? There's one paper I wanna direct your attention to. This came out of California, and you'll notice that it's got small numbers. It's got only 23 patients. However, they ended up with 48% of them healed their fistula with a lift operation. Now notice if they only had small bowel Crohn's disease, their success rate was 88%. If they had ileocolic Crohn's disease, their success rate dropped to 63%. If they had colorectal Crohn's disease, their success rate dropped to 25%. What I'm trying to get across here is that if the patient has Crohn's disease and if the rectum is uninvolved, I think you should still go ahead and try to operate on them uh, with a lift procedure. I think we need some more studies in that area. One of the studies that was recently published out of the UK, you'll notice that uh, the, the flap procedure and the lift procedure are the most common procedures now being done for complicated uh, fistula and anal. You'll notice the success rate with the lift operation. And you'll also notice that in Crohn's patients, um, the lift operation is being used and also flaps. But one of the points I want to make here <clears throat> is that if you really are going to do a flap operation, you're going to mobilize part of that internal sphincter and you're going to alter continence. Whereas with the lift operation, rarely do you alter continence at all with the lift operation. So the question is to use the lift or the flap. And I just want to put up this prospective randomized trial. This is Dr. Madboulet from Egypt, who's very experienced. And as you can see, the results are almost equal. However, he definitely feels strongly towards the lift operation today.
So then the question comes up, what do you do if you have a failed lift? And this is one of the few papers. And what really bothered me about this paper was the fact that of the eight surgeons who contributed cases, only one of them bothered to check whether he actually had closed the fistula with hydrogen peroxide. And you can see the kind of results that he got afterwards. So in closing, confirm the, the anatomy, be conservative, use non-division techniques, and reassess the situation after each intervention. And as you can tell, uh, we study our patients with ultrasound or MRI. And if it's a complex fistula, we'll usually put in a draining seton and get a nice track to work with. And if uh, we're, we'll then proceed to do a lift operation. If it fails, we'll redo a lift or possibly resort to a flap. So <clears throat> in conclusion, the lift procedure is an effective technique uh, for treating fistula and anal. And don't forget, it is not the operation, it is the operator that really is responsible for getting a good result with the operation. And don't forget also that only God makes sphincters. Thank you very much. Great. Unfortunately, we don't have the benefit of asking Professor Goldberg any questions, but I have to say personally, I really enjoyed that fantastic overview, honest, knowledgeable, and displaying tremendous personal experience in colorectal surgery. And I think those sentiments can be extended to all of our speakers today, Kieran, Dean, and Roel. Thank you for your time, not only in, in giving your lecture, but also in the time taken to prepare such high quality uh, presentations um, on behalf of the audience the college uh, and myself i'd like to thank you again for what really has been a, a very able, very enjoyable session for me with that i'll end it there um, uh, and i hope you'll to see you all soon Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Take care. Take care, everybody. Roll. nice to see you. Very nice to see you.